Greetings and welcome to This Is Revolution. My name is Jean Bajlan and I am in for Jason Miles today who is taking a rest at this difficult time for TIR. Um, before we begin today's show, I would like to remind people to like and subscribe, hit the bell. Uh, it helps us in the algorithm. You know, a lot of our videos get demonetized uh, largely because Jason uses some, let's just say, urban language when he's uh, on the show and, you know, we have to, we have to, be careful with that. Um, and of course, if you really do enjoy what we do uh, and you want to keep things going, please consider becoming a patron. It really helps us uh, you know, keep bringing these programs to you, bringing these interviews. So today, what will we be discussing? We will be discussing C.L.R. James, the well-known Marxist and historian. Uh, and, you know, some thoughts based on a recent article from our guest about CLR James and his attitude towards the question of identity politics. And our guest for today is a friend of show, Ralph Leonard, a British based writer and left wing intellectual. And also I would say a fan of CLR James, because if you follow him on Twitter, he, he actually has a picture of CLR James, a young CLR James as his uh, Twitter avatar. So he recently wrote an article in Unheard, uh, which is entitled CLR James Rejected uh, the Posturing of Identity Politics. And the article opens up with this statement. I denounce European colonialism, wrote CLR James in 1980, but I respect the learning and profound discoveries of Western civilization. A Marxist revolutionary and a Pan-Africanist, a historian and a novelist, an icon of black liberation and a diehard cricket fan, a classicist and a lover of popular culture, Cyril Lionel Robert James, described by uh, V.S. Naipaul as the master of all topics, was one of the greatest yet grossly underrated intellectuals of the 20th century. So, Let's welcome our guest for the day, the person who wrote those words, Ralph London. Hey, Ralph, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Are you uh, are you uh, still in ecstatic joy over the crowning of our new king? You know, did you watch <laughs> it on the TV? Did you pledge your undying allegiance to him? Uh, no, I didn't really watch it, and no, I don't pledge my loyalty to um, good King oh, Charles. Yeah, King Charlie. King Charlie, King Charlie, King Charlie Chester, as we like to, I like to call him. Anyway, so um, Ralph, welcome to the show, and let's talk about CLR James. So, you know, I think a lot of people have heard of CLR James. You know, people in the United States are familiar, for example, with his work on the Haitian Revolution, a uh, a work which our dear friend Pascal Robert has a lot of criti uh, critiques about. Uh, he has a different position from uh, CLR James on the Haitian Revolution. But uh, CLR James wasn't just a historian of the Haitian Revolution. Can you just tell us who he was? What was his intellectual development? You know, and what is the background to you wanting to write this article about an individual who you see as one of the most grossly underrated intellectuals of the 21st century? Mm -hmm. um, well, C.L.R. James was a Marxist revolutionary thinker who was born in Trinidad, in one of the Caribbean islands, when it was still under British rule in 1900. And what, how I like to describe C.L.R. James, because he died in 1989, and that year obviously has a big significance that that was the same year the Berlin Wall fell. And I like to think that C.L.R. James's life sort of encompassed the whole of the 20th century in terms of history and politics. So he lived through it. And the three big questions of the 20th century were fascism, Stalinism and imperialism or the colonial question. And he, so to speak, was on the right side of all three of those questions at the same time. And you can't really say that for a lot of intellectuals especially marxist intellectuals at the time um and what i sort of find fascinating about him was he was in a sense a, a polymath 
mm-hmm. um, truly sort of polymathic in, intellectual in the sense that he had so many kind of, he was able to combine sort of a, elite like uh, topics that are associated with elite people such as like the classics or like cricket because I was you know obviously known for being a very upper class sport yet he also had a very sort of appreciation for popular culture and he had a very sort of democratic sensibility that he really sort of believed that socialism was about you know everybody having a say over how society was organized such as you know the title of one of his famous pamphlets every cook can govern Mm -hmm. which sort of encompass all of that and he started out he I, I initially started as a sort of liberal nationalist anti-colonial thinker like very very young and then he became a Trotskyist and then sort of around the, you know 1956 he sort of began to sort of break away from Trotskyism and then sort of became a sort of isolated sort of independent Marxist intellectual and I think so even though he didn't really lose his radicalism or his Marxist way of thinking uh, I think it also did show how he sort of became a bit alienated from sort of the mainstream Marxist revolutionary movement yeah so he was he he was an early critic of Stalinism Mm -hmm. and then uh, and out of that critique, he he became a Trotskyist, and then in the fifties, he became critical of the Trotskyist movement as as well, and you know sort of left that, and became a kind of free floating Marxist uh, intellectual, kind of homeless uh, yeah. in- intellectual in that sense. Yeah, and he engaged with all sorts of um, questions like the colonial question. So how he sort of interacted with various thinkers, like you know, or figures like Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana or even Walter Rodney or mm-hmm. you know who was a fellow Caribbean who became more sympathetic with the uh, Nairere uh, government in Tanzania socialist mm-hmm. government there yeah and just just to just add this that one of his more underrated works is a book called he didn't quite finish it because it's called American Civilization Mm -hmm. which I think is very underrated because he's grappling again with one of the, you know, key subjects of, you know, the 20th century is America and how, you know, because this was a country that in the 20th century became the superpower, uh, became the dominant superpower in, you know, the West, dominant capitalist power. And I I find it so very interesting how he was able to, analyze america as a civilization not just a country or a nation from you know as from the inside when he lived there and he was so prescient in a lot of ways of how he analyzed american culture society class relations and so, and so on can you give us a little bit of a taste of his thesis in 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 his writings on america like what was his takeaways on american uh, civilization why do you say he was prescient in in many ways because he identified a very a contradiction within america between this very democratic sensibility you find among the people the sense of a kind of collective individualism if you will as mm-hmm. paradoxical as that sounds but and this sort of the potential that lay in sort of popular culture like comic books, Hollywood, mm. uh, you know, movies and how um, it sort of a kind of new way of uh, imagining like the world that we live in and American culture, popular culture was expressing that. Yet at the same time, he saw within America this sort of rise of a more bureaucratic sort of top down sort of managerial sort of system that was in line with like the dominant trends like you know even you saw it with stalinism with you know a big state so sort of trying to manage everything and with the european social democracy with the yeah. post-colonial governments where you have uh 
you know, the growth of state power, the centralization of uh, national identities, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in this article, you are highlighting C.L.A. James's rejection of the posturing of identity politics. So I think it's important because, you know, identity politics is a word that's thrown around a lot these days and it can mean different things to different people. So when you talk about identity politics, what exactly are you talking about? I'm talking about a form of politics or radicalism that takes as its starting point, uh, basing itself on a kind of ethno racial communalist consciousness and it seeks to sort of base its radicalism from that point yeah right so so what would be examples of this concrete examples of of, like of... one concrete example would be say black nationalism that's mm -hmm. sort of the obvious uh that's you know it takes that black people are a kind of nation or community we have which has a common interest vis-a-vis -vis, you know white society or whatever else and that politics should be take that the black interest should be the starting point of one's kind of political struggle so it's basically um you would argue then that it's it, uh, identity politics is a form of politics that is a rejection of class-based politics in favor yeah. of a politics that's predicated on on uh, a fundamental antagonism between different identitarian groups so black nationalism mm -hmm. might be one version uh, you could argue islamism would be mm -hmm. a, a, another word version even some forms of anti-imperialism that posit that the primary contradiction in the world is between you know the uh, uh, capitalist west and the you know oppressed masses of the developing uh, well, yeah. developing world so uh it, it's based on a kind of uh revolutionary and uh, 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 uh an antagonism but one that is not class-based which there may be class elements to it and these thinkers may at times talk in class terms but their primary their primary basis for for political mobilization is on these communal uh, identities even yeah. though that perhaps within these movements there are some which pay more heed to the sort of class question but it's one a second order issue to the question of ethno national liberation emancipation etc etc would that yeah. be a fair summation of yeah. what whereas you would say a class based politics puts class first and there may of course be a recognition of you know ethno national oppression etc but it's the political mobilization is rooted in this notion of class politics as being the primary an antagonism from which other forms of oppression flow yes yes uh, yeah but i think clr change was a bit more subtle in how he um grasped that because when he was writing when he was writing about america or south africa he knew that the race question kind of was very paramount because those societies had were literally racially segregated societies that defined themselves their own self conception based on racial superiority so in order to do kind of have a struggle for progress in those so you have to kind of address the the obvious elephant in the room that you have a class of people who are being subordinated by their race mm -hmm. and you have and you kind of have to strategically kind of support the movement among those peoples to emancipate themselves, to achieve like, you know, equal rights, formal freedoms, even, even on the kind of basic liberal democratic mode of it. So in rejecting identity politics, CLR James was not quote unquote, what is often called a class reductionist which I often think class reductionism is applied to is, a, is, is applied extremely misleadingly to many on the left who do recognize the importance of ethno-national questions and questions of, of oppression of particular identity groups, 
uh, but whose politics is predicated on class uh, class politics. I think, you know, often it's a kind of uh, many of the people who are critique critics of the Marxist left are somewhat disingenuous in their portrayal as you know class first politics as being a rejection completely of any kind of notions of uh, you know ethno national or racial oppression. I think. Well, a better way, a way to put it was he wasn't an economism. He didn't subscribe to it, an economistic way of, you know, a kind of vulgar economism that, you know, was strictly kind of down the line. Oh, it's just about wages or income inequality or stuff like that. No, because what he saw with class was just how the relationships that define the mode of political economy. So mm -hmm. that's what that's what class is for at least for Marxists. It's not kind of a you know a kind of sort of because because uh, a lot of the ways people talk about class, you you would think that they were talking about caste, like mm -hmm. just different types of people who are just who be belong to sort of rigid structures. Like you know, obviously you have the working class at the bottom, mm -hmm. middle class rich people blah 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 but without understanding kind of like you know kind of the relationships within the you know mode of production that defines yeah. how these social relationships express themselves right so he took uh, what we might call the ideological superstructure seriously uh, in his understanding of uh, of politics and i think the point you raise about the question of class versus caste is an important one because you know class society has existed for a, lo a long time but there is something fundamentally different about modern capitalist class society in that you know in feudal eras uh, the difference between classes although there was of course social mobility but was it was often defined in terms of set different sets of legal uh, privileges and rights and responsibilities uh, uh, and in modern capitalist society, the the liberal ideal is the abolition of all those legal distinctions. Although not, although there is still a class society, it's just one that is, to a certain degree, obfuscated by a universalist yeah. uh, legal order and political order and individual uh, order. Mm -hmm. So, when uh, when talking about uh, him rejecting the posturing of identity politics what was he critiquing at the time he uh, i i led with this quote that he has where he where he is on one hand reject, rejecting colonialism and imperialism but at the same time uh, expressing his admiration for certain of the achievements of quote unquote western civilization uh how how might we understand that within the context of his time what was he what did he mean by this what did he want what did he want to say Mm -hmm. See, when, um, it's funny because um, Richard Wright, the novel, the American, African-American novelist, had a quote where he said, I'm black, I'm a man of the West. And what he meant, what he meant by Western was simply modernity, mm -hmm. modern, modern civilization. And that's what C.L.R. James means when he talks about Western civilization, which is the, 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 the um, body of philosophical, political thought that has shaped our entire world. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was, and the sort of way of thing he's arguing against is to this kind of sort of black nationalist way of thinking. And you even see it now with sort of so called like decolonial theories now that sort of has a kind of simple negationist stance with you know the west or european civilization that uh, nothing uh, from it is you know useful or has done us any done any good it's all just imperialistic capitalist etc well clr james sort of saw the 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 potential within like these thought to advance the realm of through freedom so it, he he would say that it's not one can't can't just reject you know 
you know, Cervantes or Goethe or Shakespeare or so, be, because of their dead white men. No, because mm -hmm. they have something to say about the human condition and human existence and that it would apply to as well to you know a black caribbean person or a chinese person as much as a white european um, man and he, he also made the point that when he was asked specifically about whether oh is shakespeare relevant to caribbean people and he would he would say in in tandem with richard wright that well first of all people of black caribbean people of the caribbean are as much shaped by western civilization as much as by sort of african sort of ancestor culture because you know the the history of modernity is as well a kind of mingling of cultures uh, often through of of course very violent means through slavery and or the coolie system after the abolition of slavery mm -hmm. but even but out of that comes like you know uh, a a basis for kind of real universal freedom and that's like that's the contradiction he recognized so he rejects the notion that for example the canon of West western culture or the canon of enlightenment thinking is purely the inheritance of white men but argues that uh it is it is also fundamentally linked to uh, the history, for example, of Black Caribbeans who are shaped by, quote unquote, uh, Western civilization, or perhaps we might more accurately call it bourgeois civilization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, because, you know, not all white countries yeah. were necessarily uh, at the vanguard of, quote unquote, yeah. white civilization, the history of the, you know, people in the Balkans were white people, but they're relationship to uh, what is called Western civilization and the canon of Western civilization is quite different to you know the canon in Britain and and, uh, and France so he's he's in, in a sense rejecting a kind of negation a, a reaction against uh, imperialism and colonialism and white supremacy and the history of racism a reaction which is perhaps understandable but a reaction which he Kind of sees as throwing the baby out with the bathwater that is you know in, in, in trying to reject imperialism uh this is turning into a almost a kind of cultural struggle which seeks not only to uh, get rid of the political and economic modes of domin domination which western countries and imperialist countries uh, exercise over the, the global south but also that is seeking to reject the in, you know the entirety of enlightenment uh, thought and modernity and uh, negating that in favor of a kind of uh, cultural anti-imperialism yeah this is it's the argument against negritude mm -hmm. that you know in rejecting colonialism we have to sort of recover some kind of authentic you know african essence mm -hmm that has been traumatized by imperialism and he, he rejected that uh, so why was he why would he reject uh why does he reject uh cu the cultural aspects of decolonization then because it would be one a very backward backward looking perspective that it's it's as if to say that we have to sort of recover our past or try to right the wrongs of the past instead of so to speak building a better future and that's that was what clr james was a more futuristic you know thinker of the future society so his his pan-africanism was not predicated on a kind of cultural nationalism no uh, that uh, but rather on the desire to construct a new Africa, one that, you know, can overcome uh, colonialism, but one that does not become reactionary and use culture to, um, in a sense, build an alternative nationalist order, one which uh, inverts, let's inverts the 
normative hierarchy of colonialism, of white supremacy, of Western superiority, and its responses to just reverse that, uh, but not actually surpass it and, and create something fundamentally new. He was a future-orientated thinker. Yes. Yeah. So what? why do you feel the need then, why are you feeling the need at this particular moment to write about C.L.R. James and this tent, his, his, uh, 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 his way of thinking, which on the one hand is, is a, you know, a strong critique of imperialism and colonialism, but at the same time is a defense of what is called quote unquote, Western civilization, or at least uh, radical and democratic tendencies within Western civilization that he believes can provide the tools for uh, people in the colonial and semi-colonial world to achieve full political, economic, and social emancipation? Um, I think it's important because obviously you hear about, the, you know, you hear debates about uh, wokeness or multiculturalism or uh, decolonizing all the time and yes there is this position about you know you have to decolonize we have to you know this kind of what I call a kind of pseudo cultural radicalism that that often that you find in academic settings that oh we have to decolonize everything you know decolonize geography decolonize the curriculum etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you kind of have a a right wing sort of reaction to that that if you will sort of just reassert a kind of western chauvinism mm -hmm. that oh actually you know dead white men you know that has this sort of very essentialist romantic view of quote unquote western civilization that we yeah that just We're and the two kind of just are the inverts of of, of each other. Yeah, I mean, I see the you know when we look at a lot of uh, right wing thinkers, uh, popular right wing thinkers today, you know, when they talk about Western culture, Western civilization, I'm very skeptical about whether they've read Adam Smith or whether they've read Cervantes or whether they they yeah. they haven't actually read any of the canon of Western civilization. It's just a kind of cultural marker for them that oh, this is the canon. But they actually don't engage with the canon. It's just like a very superficial un, a cultural understanding of Western civilization. And then obviously, this is, in, in a sense, a sort of counter reaction to this. Uh, I mean, you know, to speak concretely, we can look at uh, the popularity of 1619 Project, the popularity of Gerald Horn and his thesis about yeah. the American Revolution. We can look at critical race theory. We can uh, look at uh, a lot of the philosophy behind uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion as uh, being a negation of this. And then, of course, the right-wing reaction to this uh, negation is to, ha you know, I mean, we saw it with 1619. I mean, one, although there's a lot of critiques about 1619, it was an attempt to engage with historiography. Obviously, the government's response in the United States to yeah. 1776 was an absolutely intellectually sterile and lazy um, uh, response. But it's an interest. It's interesting that we are seeing this kind of dialectic, this cultural war. And I think it's it's interesting because you know when I look at stuff, the let's say the complex. Uh, that exists, the the ideological complex around 1619 Project, critical race theory, uh, the writings of Gerald Horn as just examples uh, of this. It's almost as if, uh, it's almost like a, a attempting to create, instead of surpassing the old nationalism of the past, it's the, an attempt to create a new American nationalist uh, narrative yeah. in which black people are at the center of and that the persecution uh, of black people is the uh, uh, you know the key dynamic in American history and thus uh, Americans should give the black middle class you know some reparations and you know diversity hires and and, and that's like addressing the past but it's still a kind of sort of a nationalistic uh, yeah, narrative. It's it's, it's what Orwell called negative nationalism. Mm -hmm. You know, it still operates within this sort of like narrow nationalistic frame. And you even see it with Britain with how even slavery 
you know how the British Empire gets talked about and uh, even the sort of kind of liberal multicultural sort of story that you know a lot of liberals try to tell about how you know this is modern Britain from you know the way you know the wind rush migration right etc yeah it's it's kind of a new kind of liberal nationalism mm -hmm. and it, as opposed to say the more kind of conservative traditional sort of more chauvinistic chauvinistic, chauvinistic. nationalism yeah exactly so, yeah. so we have uh, so we have this this kind of uh fight over the national narrative uh, which has various iterations i mean we see it in britain i mean look at uh, you know, there's a lot of critical work on the British Empire, which obviously, you know, particularly after the rise of the new left, there was a you know, big reassessment of Britain's role in the world and the old kind of empire patriotism that was promoted by the British state that was critiqued. Uh, and this critique has continued to this day. And there is a reaction uh, amongst the right. You see writers like Nigel Bigger, like trying to, who is a ethicist in, yeah. in, uh, in um, at Oxford, who's trying to like rehabilitate the British empire, centering it on Britain's uh, crusade against slavery in the yeah. 19th century, or, you know, more famously, yeah. someone like um, uh, Niall Ferguson, yeah. Niall yeah. Ferguson, who's like, actually, yeah, the British empire did bad things, but other empires were worse. And, you know, it, it was good. So we have this kind of fight a moralistic fight that takes place like was the british empire good or bad and and uh it kind of just it's it's like an endless cycle I and mean, we, we don't ever surpass it really and clr james i think is someone who was trying to go beyond a kind of negation of uh empire uh, a negation of the imperial narratives yeah just a simple negation that well everything from the legacy of the collision between say europe and so to speak the rest mm -hmm. is ipso facto just bad and it has to be rejected on toto but it's like the base of but that collision sort of paradoxically and it's it's very hard for a lot of people to understand get this that the collision with imperialism simultaneously creates the basis for kind of new emancipation on a higher level mm -hmm. a new kind of universal emancipation because you know the history of globalization you know the british empire had a big role in it mm -hmm. the, the expansion of british empire the expansion of capitalist relations all across the world outside of europe was through much of you know in most cases through the european empire and and not only that i think uh, a lot of people see modern industrial civilization as emerging in the west and then spreading out and subjugating the rest of the world which i think is perhaps a misleading way to imagine it because it's 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 something that is brought about because of the raw because of the growing interaction and globalization of the world the enlightenment and all these things are not just something internal to european civilization yeah. but is a product of the contact that european civilization and the often brutal contact european civilization had with other parts of the world you know it, it, it you know the birth of capitalism is a global process it's not a process that happens in europe and spreads to the rest of the world it is yeah. part and parcel of the his entire global history the destructions of uh you know the distinct what the world system theories would call the world systems the distinct economic and political and cultural units that and they're blending into a global capitalist uh civilization so people in the global south and the developing world are very much part uh, even if it's kind of obfuscated, but a part of what created the intellectual uh, tumult that led to the Enlightenment and the emergence of these universalist ideals. Yeah, yes. And the Haitian Revolution, if you will, is the apogee of that uh, process. Um, 
do you want to outline you know clr james obviously wrote on the haitian revolution do you want to outline why the haitian revolution is so critical in understanding the universalism of universalism mm -hmm. because well the haitian revolution started in 1791 not like you know short not that long after the french revolution and it was usually you know it started off as a kind of usual slave uprising it started by a bookman a sort of shaman and then as the rebellion became bigger and bigger it became something more than just a another rebellion it was a full-on revolution where these um slaves and then that's where Toussaint Lavature sort of came out of as the leader and what he did was to take this rebellion and give it a full-on political vision. And he was especially influenced by, you know, French Enlightenment thinkers like Abbe Reynal, Rousseau, read the military military campaigns of Julius Caesar. You know? And in fact, there's actually a story about how uh, these slaves uprose in a plantation and they burnt down everything but except, but except there was one book that wasn't burnt and then when the plantation owner came back and he saw the book it was on the page of this was Abbe Reynal's uh, book and it was on the page where he talks about the slaves uprising for their freedom mm -hmm. I think that's a very kind of po poetic um, sort of way of showing it because the slaves kind of not only overthrew in the end the colonial regime but they built up their own state a black republic and this is what this is why um the swiss enlightenment thinker benjamin constant very even shockingly at the time which says that you know to some of his colleagues that you know all this stuff about all oh, these negroes are inferior to us well they built up institutions that are just as, you know, just as valid as anything a European could come up with. Right, so, and there's, and uh, even slave owners in the South mm -hmm. uh, had a respect for Ouverture and uh, what, it, you know, w the achievements of the Haitian Revolution. But I think that's a critical point, because even though these Enlightenment ideas originate amongst, let's say, are articulated by, uh, you know, dead white men, are, uh, you know, coming into being in the intellectual centers of Europe, London, Paris, Scotland, uh, the uh, 13 colonies and places like that. There is a universalism to these ideas, which allows them to be appropriated, allows them to be appropriated by uh, other peoples to achieve their emancipation that, that mm -hmm. obviously it, there have been historically slave uprisings, right? That is, you know, that this myth of like the passive sla uh, African slave in the Americas yeah. is a, a, a fantasy. The, you know, it's whether it's a kind of uh, a quotidian resistance working slow or whether it's like a physical uprising, people resist enslavement. But these enlightenment ideas uh, uh, became tools to uh, mm. move beyond a kind of impulse of uh, freedom towards providing a ideological, political, and institutional framework for a post-slavery uh, society that the these, this universalism, I mean, you see it in, in America with, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass's uh, writings about the 4th of July and his highlightings of the contradiction, the, the ideological contradictions that the American Revolution creates. I mean, we can, of course, point to, for example, on a practical level, the racism, the white supremacy, uh, all these things which are implicit in the American pr political project, but it has a contradiction within it because it also is the American experiment is predicated on the universalist ideas, which in a very real way are, can be taken up by groups to attack the, yeah. the, the hierarchies of, of racial oppression on the very grounds that the so-called dead white men are providing legitimacy for the government. So it's like it's almost like weaponry. Right. Yeah. It's like it, it, it provides an ideological weaponry for people to achieve emancipation on a higher uh, level. I mean, from my own 
uh, academic work, you know, in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, uh, there was a process of centralization. And the first Kurdish rebellions of the 19th century were largely, you know, uh, princely, princely uh, feudal subordinates trying to maintain their uh, privileges within the system. But by the late uh, 19th century, uh, we begin to see, even amongst tribal leaders, the adoption as a kind of weapon of the discourse of nationalism and popular sovereignty to sort of uh, frame resistance to the process of centralization and state, the creation of state borders. So these ideas are appropriatable by different groups to realize their emancipation. As we see, you know, colonial empires in the 19th century were had a deep ideological con contradiction within them that previous iterations of empires did not have because these were very often em liberal, liberal yeah. empires but you know they were ideologically unsustainable because you can't be predicating yourself on liberal democratic values at the same time as having tyrannical colonial empires so they had yeah so liberalism had within it the kind of roots of the destruction of the Western imperial order in it. Yes, and it's and one reason why the Haitian Revolution is unique, and I think really one of the most significant events in the history of the world, is because, like you said, there have always been slave uprisings. Spartacus, the Zanj, mm -hmm. uh, rebellion against the Abbasids, um, but what was different about the Haitian Revolution was the moment of the historical moment it took place in, mm -hmm. because how the meaning of freedom was was starting to be transformed. Because in previous epochs, freedom and slavery were very much intertwined. Mm -hmm. That the freedom of a few directly dependent on the slavery of the majority. You know, Aristotle, the Greeks, you could look at any society this is all true but then with the coming of modernity with the coming of bourgeois civilization the the basis for what if you will freedom for all this was what hegel's whole point that was tied to really come into being and the haitian revolution i think even even only for even if it was only for a moment so really kind of expressed that truly universal freedom that even for the enslaved negro liberté egalité fraternity is as much his birthright as it is for the french peasant or the son of liberty in america mm. yeah. and 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 this i mean people often forget it but before the first world war before the russian revolution liberalism and constitutionalism was a revolutionary ideal across the colonial and semi-colonial world. If we look at, you know, the political movements, for example, that resisted Western imperialism uh, before the First World War, we see liberalism and constitutionalism as, as constituting core <coughs> revolutionary ideas. You look at the Urabi revolt in Egypt, which was directed against the tyr uh, tyranny of the Khadiv of Egypt, but also against foreign economic and political exploitation and the, uh, the public debt administration and the beggaring of the country by uh, imperial interests. Well, the political solution was the creation of a constitutionalist uh, uh, order, the desire to limit the authority of the uh, Khadiv to create a constitutional monarchy and to empower the masses of the population. We see this with the constitutional revolutions in the Ottoman Empire, in Iran, in China, and all these places, these uh, the initial revolutionary upsurges to overthrow uh, the Ancien Regime and at the same time to uh, get rid of foreign domination, these were motivated by liberalism yeah. or a revolutionary yeah, it, liberalism yeah even in uh nigeria where i'm partly from the original nationalist movement was a liberal nationalist movement to so to speak unite the various ethnic groups of nigeria under a sort of more constitutional 
Republican sort of government. And that's why the Nigerian flag is, of course, based on the tricolor mm -hmm. in France. Yeah. So, you know, there was a real internalization of the uh, of these amongst the first generation of uh, uh, of, you know, anti-colonial activists and, and revolutionaries who saw themselves as not rejecting liberalism per se, but exposing the hypocrisy of Western discourse about liberalism, that the Westerners are talking about the mission civilatrice, they're talking about all these yeah. things, but in fact, they aren't living up to the ideals which are universalist. So the critique was not of universalism and uh, bourgeois political thought per se, but rather about the inconsistent way and that in which in which it is being applied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously the story of the anti-colonial movement has its own contradictions because in a lot of places where the colonial regimes were overthrown, what would replace them was a more sort of aggressively nationalistic, mostly dictatorial sort of regimes or based on sort of ethnic sort of uh, clan based regimes. Like even like in Nigeria, I could, I could say that after the colonial regime was overthrown, what we then had was a series of military coups, brutal civil war, and a very kind of fractured um, political and fragile political system that's often still to this day based on ethnic sectarian lines. Right. So as we're coming up to the hour, I want to I want to uh, ask you then. You know, you want to highlight CLR James in your article because of his mm -hmm. like nuanced approach in uh, approaching the question of. Uh, universalism and his rejection of identity politics yeah. and obviously you're writing it for this specific mo moment what do you think is driving the uh let's say identity politics elan of much of the existing quote-unquote left today why why is this identity politics frame so dominant is it an intellectual problem or is there a material basis for this what 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 what's what's causing it in your opinion um i think one was the clear failures of stalinism and the old marxist revolutionary movements to act to you know actually do anything of uh you know to actually enact progress towards socialism and because of that failure i think there was a certain kind of despair and sort of alienation from it from a class of intellectuals so then they sort of i think sort of pivoted towards this more identitarian frame as a as an alternative mm -hmm. and then there's also a broader social problem you know what's called the cultural turn within sort of you know various academic disciplines so where kind of culture sort of become like the interpreters the primary antagonism within the so you know society is different you know you see this on the right and the left they sort of talk in this sort of culturalized terms so like society is made up of these sort of cultural groups cultural types a community of communities you know that's what like you know i think a a theory of multicultural often defines it, you know, a nation's a, a community of communities. You know? mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and we, you know, society has to sort of manage the differing interests between these groups. I think, and it's all, and it's, as always, there's always a kind of a dialectic between the ideas and the material form in mm -hmm. this. So, yeah, I think that's, that's how I would answer it. How would you relate it, for example, I mean, w one of the thoughts I have, and, you know, obviously it's not fully uh, developed, is also that this cultural turn on the left is in part a response to, like you say, their political failures at home, but also the kind of idea that uh, one of the most dynamic 
struggles against you know western capitalism during the 20th century was the decolonial struggles right the wars in vietnam and uh, other parts of the world where uh, where it seemed that you know this was something that the frankfurt school and the critical uh, theory crowd were into that you know the 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 proletariat had been bought off it was no longer the revolutionary yeah. subject and there was a desire to find an alternative revolutionary subject and that alternative revolutionary subject was found in the uh, uh colonial and semi-colonial world where you had these you know vigorous struggles anti-imperialist struggles and thus you know you you have uh, a reorientating of the left towards uh a, a, rather than a class-based um way of looking at the world a core periphery way of looking at the world that the struggle is between this core and this uh, uh periphery w would you would you say that's part of the question or do you think i'm off base in thinking that um i think that yeah in the i think yes in the 1970s there was there was some of that with like third worldist maoism who talked in those terms and um, even like say you read like monthly review you know paul mm -hmm. sweezy's uh magazine and they sort of had that opinion that the western proletariat had been pacified if you will by you know consumer capitalism post-war post-war consumer capitalism and you know the peasants the third world peasantry and the lump of proletariat hadn't been like completely subsumed by this they hadn't been subsumed by this so yeah they were like the new revolutionary subject against monopoly capitalism and imperialism but i think now it's a, yes there is certainly a residue of that with decolonial thought because mm -hmm. uh, you know because they talk about like epistemic delinking which is that's taken from uh samir amin's delinking mm -hmm. uh, idea but they just do it at a more academic level whereas i mean meant it in a political economy sense yeah, sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and um yeah and uh i mean yeah i mean was a was uh was a, a critique of imperialism he was uh what, what was it's not world systems theory it's uh Depend dependency, dependency theory. theory yeah dependency theory he was the pioneer of dependency theory which you know has a lot of overlap with Marxism yeah. in some ways, but also to a certain degree is with nationalism. With nationalism. And as Samir Amin, I believe, was actually a supporter of Sadat, was it? Or he was a supporter of Egyptian nationalism at some uh, at some point. So it was a kind of uh, radical, uh, 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 an idea of decolonization, uh, which was rooted in political yeah. economy, but which was actually uh it's nationalistic autarchy, autarchy yeah. nationalist autarchy, yeah which which is which was not at the time of course particularly at variance with mainline marxist leninist stalinist political thought which looked at you know socialism one country and national roads to socialism that you, yeah. you had various national roads to socialism so it was it's almost uh you know a lot of this is to do i think with the internalization of the nation state and nationalism within you know left-wing politics i mean you know when we look at the second international figures like lenin were like truly internationalist the russian revolution wasn't meant to be the russian revolution it was meant to be step one on yeah uh, on a european wide wide revolution uh, and it yeah. was planned in that way then uh, when the mensheviks were like no no we can't seize power in Russia, we need to develop capitalism f uh, first. Lenin's critique was not, no, we do need to seize power so we can do national developmentalism. His idea was, no, we need to seize power so that we can trigger a revolution in the rest of, in, in, in the rest of Europe. It was not, there was no Russian road to socialism for, <laughs> for Lenin. The isolation of the Russian revolution led to a crisis and the necessity almost of socialism one and one country the like the political uh, necessity but i think that's a lot very hard for people to comprehend today because the form of the nation state uh, has become universal decolonization was in many ways the ultimate victory of the capitalist political form because the nation state yeah. is 
the ideology of rising capitalism. And and with um, neoliberal globalization, you've had a more deepening of capitalist social relations, like all across the world, mm -hmm. in a way that is simply unprecedented. Now, obviously, it's you know I use this phrase from Trotsky: combined and uneven Even development, because like it's part of one totality well do you want to do you want to just outline what you mean by combined uneven development what trotsky means by un combined uneven development for people who aren't aware so it's saying it's basically that uh capitalism is a sort of global totality so it's not this idea of sort of analyzing capitalism from like you know british capitalism or french capitalism like in this sort of nation state frame <laughs> doesn't really work because capitalist relations are global international mm. inherently and and you have to analyze it from that point but at the same time it's not capitalist relations don't take place equally across various nations so that obviously there is some nations develop are highly developed other nations are developed to lesser degrees but this is the difference between combine an even development and say dependency theory because dependency theory says that well the third world can't is like it's incapable of like a level of capitalist development because of you know imperialism and uh colonialism but there have been examples post-war of poor nations that were non-white or part of the third world that have achieved a le level of capitalist development like south korea the asian tiger economies you know china this is mm -hmm. a big example of this so, you know and, and there's a there was actually there's an actually an old book by um a british trotskyist from the a uh, from the swp uh the former swp called uh nigel harris which is called the end of the third world which is about this Asian, the development of the Asian tigers in the 1980s, and he uses that to sort of critique the dependency theorists, was saying that yeah, look, there's a here's a, examples of formerly third world countries that have achieved a level of capitalist development, you know, and industrialization with within this global system. And well, I think it, yeah. and another important aspect of it, of course, is the idea that you can have extremely modern forms of technology and development uh, being alongside barbarous forms of social relation and economic development. And <clears throat> especially in, quote unquote, the late developing countries, you have very modern forms. Uh, sometimes a good example, just so that people know, like if you if you go on the London tube, it's a kind of shitty old fashioned tube. It's dirty. It doesn't look good. But if you go to the tube in Istanbul, it's like super modern and nice and like yeah. way better than the London tube. And uh, that's despite the fact that economically Turkey is less developed than uh, uh, um, Britain. But when they do develop, they're not going through all the stages of technological development to catch up with the West. They're adopting the like very modern forms. They're not. Yeah. They're not like bringing in steam trains and then <laughs> doing it like that. They're just adopting whatever the newest form. So you have this situation where you have very modern forms coexisting alongside, uh, you know, right. Russia is a good example of this. Yeah. Before the Russian Revolution, you have these major, huge factories of iron and steel armaments industry existing alongside like the most like barbarous forms of peasant exploitation and feudalism. Yeah. So, so we, so yeah, looking at capitalism a, a, as a totality. Yeah. So and, yeah. Yeah, and Russia, at the time, was like was, at least in Trotsky's view, like a sort of uh, a, a preview for the rest of the what? world. What, what it was going to look what like. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we're coming up against the hour, uh, and so I want to ask you: Do you have any? finishing thoughts you want us to end on anything you would recommend people to start reading if they want to start reading clr james uh a, a, a good recommendation would be his autobiography called beyond the boundary and it's good because 
it's it's a it's weird because it's uh there's an aspect of it that's a kind of sociology of cricket mm-hmm. and even even if you're not a cricket fan and i'm not a cricket fan personally you will sort of be it will you will be interested by it because how he talks about how those how his um how he was inducted as in into a certain kind of gen english gentleman ethos within that cricketing sphere and how that sort of would help him when he was in later in life even as a revolutionary so okay. that's one of the yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well ralph the article is called uh, clr james rejected uh, the posturing of identity politics is published by unheard there'll be a link in the description i would uh, recommend that everybody if they have a chance to take a look at it and ralph we hope to see you again when you have other you. writings for us to talk about thank you so much thank you we are out <laughs>